Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well this afternoon. This is, let's see, Psych 301 Research Design and Methodology, I hope. And I hope you can read that uh, on the video as well. This is how I'm going to have to be doing my lectures uh, the rest of the time. And so I'm going to make videos of all my lectures and then I'll post them. we got a YouTube channel set up for the class and I'll send you links through the announcements when the videos are available and I'll also have links available uh, somewhere on the Canvas site for all the videos that I do. So I apologize that we have to do things this way. Uh, this is kind of weird for me. i got to keep my energy level up while trying to give lectures to uh, nobody here. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I'm going to try and get the videos done by class time every day and get the links posted. And then I also want to emphasize that yes, we are in fact having uh, our stats quiz on Friday. And I have some information about the stats quiz. There it is. Let me get it up. All right. Here's a, a, a slide about the stats quiz. The stats quiz will be on Friday. I'll try to have it up uh, by 2 p.m. on Friday, the stats quiz. And so these will be problems that you're going to have to work on your own. They'll be on Canvas. Then you work them on your own, on your own paper. And then what I'm going to have you do is you can take a picture of them and then email me the picture of your work. Uh, or you can mail them in. I'm going to have more details about that. I'll have an announcement all about that as it approaches, and I'm going to try and work out all the details before lecture on Wednesday. But I just wanted to prepare you for that, so you won't be under any time limit. You'll have a lot of time to do it. Uh, I'll give you essentially the weekend to complete it. But the tests that are fair game, there are four old tests. The test of a single sample mean, between subjects t-test, within subjects t-test, the between subjects variance test, and then three new tests, the Between Subjects One-Way ANOVA, the Within Subjects One-Way ANOVA, and the Between Subjects Factorial ANOVA. Now, I haven't decided how many questions there are going to be on the test right now. I would guess either definitely at least two, but maybe three, and I guarantee at least one will be an ANOVA. One will be an ANOVA for sure. I'll have to work that all out. I'll have more details uh, about the quiz on Wednesday, but just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Okay, let's get this slide away, please. All right, there we are. And now we're back to the original. Well, I'm going to try and do what I do in class. Realize they won't let me go into school, and so I'm, I'm left with the technology that I have here at home, which isn't very sophisticated, unfortunately, but I'm going to try and do the best that I can. So our lecture today, uh, today's lecture is for uh, Monday... Monday, March 23rd, uh, and I want to put up my email address. My email address is ecooper at istate.edu. So if you have any questions during the lecture, what I want you to do is send me an email, and then I will uh, send your response back to you. If you can remember what the timestamp was on uh, the um, uh video when you had the question that might help but whatever even if you don't get that go ahead and ask your question and I'll do my best to try and answer it so that's how we'll proceed with that so our lecture today is about uh, naturalistic observation we've been doing uh, kind of the you know minor research techniques in psychology we did quasi experiments on Friday and today we'll do naturalistic observation if you've forgotten what that is, it's a research technique in which the researcher simply observes and describes behavior. Okay, and it's often done with animal populations. We talked about uh, Jane Goodall's work with the chimpanzees of the Gombe Preserve in Africa. That is probably the most famous uh, 
of all the naturalistic observations. And so animals uh, is often the population we work with when we're doing naturalistic observation. But there is a type of naturalistic observation most often done with humans. And so let's mention that one. That is participant observation, participant observation. And that is a naturalistic observation in which the researcher becomes a member of the group being observed. Okay. Yeah, you can't do naturalistic observation with animal groups uh, very easily. They can figure out uh, what's going on. But with human groups, yes, participant observation is uh, one way that you can go. We're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, participant observations a little bit later. Uh, but let's mention one now. So this kind of illustrates some of the good things and some of the bad things about uh, participant observations. So uh, there was a, this guy, Leon Festinger. He's the guy who came up with the concept of cognitive dissonance. And I bet a lot of you have had like uh, Psych 280 maybe, or it's just social psychology and hadn't have talked about uh, cognitive dissonance maybe in there. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of cognitive dissonance, it's kind of a defense mechanism that people use when they get uncomfortable information about something. So an example would be, let's say we had uh, some guy who had just purchased a truck, a very expensive truck that he'd saved up for for a long time. He's passing a newsstand and he sees like Car and Driver magazine, he sees a picture of the truck he just bought on the cover of Car and Driver magazine. And so he picks up the magazine and he sees that the title of the article is The 10 Biggest Automotive Ripoffs. And the truck he bought is like number one on the list. Well, now, naturally, that would be upsetting to see that the truck you just saved up for was number one on the list of biggest automotive ripoffs. And so the theory of cognitive dissonance says is what this guy is going to do to try and, like, ignore this uncomfortable information is, like, think of all the reasons why he bought the truck in the first place, the reasons why he wanted to buy it. And that'll help him to ignore this uh, uncomfortable information that it was one of the biggest automotive ripoffs. And so what can happen, this is the strange thing that can happen, is that people, after they get uh, some information that we might consider to be negative information about the choice they've just made, can actually become more positive about the choice because of that, because of this cognitive dissonance, because they uh, tried to think up th the reasons why they made the decision they did to ignore this uncomfortable information that they're getting. Okay, so uh, let's talk about one of the most famous examples of a participant observation. And this was Festinger, the guy who came up with the concept of cognitive dissonance. This was in uh, the mid-1950s. Festinger was a professor at Stanford, and he had read in the paper about this group of uh, people, kind of a cult, that had gathered around this woman named Mrs. Keach. And Mrs. Keach claimed that she'd been visited by aliens from the planet Clarion. And the aliens had told her that on December 21st, 1956, the world was going to end. There was going to be giant fissures that appeared in the Earth's surface, and water was going to pour out of these fissures and fill the entire Earth uh, with water. And what was going to happen is, just before this happened, the uh, Guardians were going to come down in their spaceship and they were going to save Mrs. Keach and her followers, take them back to Planet Clarion with them. And so Mrs. Keach and her followers were waiting for this event. Uh, and they, you know, they didn't try to proselytize, they, by which I mean they didn't try to get other people to join the cult. They just knew this, this was going to happen and they were preparing uh, for that event. Well, Festinger thought when he read about this in the paper that this would be a good way to test his theory because he didn't think the world was actually going to end on December 21st, 1956. And he wanted to see what would happen to this group when the, pr the predicted event didn't actually occur. 
So, Festinger and two of his graduate students joined this cult. Uh, and so he did a, a participant observation with this cult and kept track of them. Like I said, they didn't try to get anybody to join. They just talked about what their life was going to be like when they got to the planet Clarion, things like that. And so they went to the spot where they were supposed to pick, be picked up on December 21st, 1956. And they waited, and what do you know, the spaceship never did show up. And now the question I have for you, as you're a student of psychology, is what do you think happened uh, to this cult? Did the cult say, uh, wow, I, you know, I, I think we've really been deluding ourselves here, and we're just really a bunch of crazy people, that's one option. The other option is, oh, wow. Our efforts here on Earth have saved the planet. And it's very important that we keep going because otherwise the planet will be destroyed. Well, I think, students of psychology that you are, know they chose the second option. They decided that their actions on Earth had saved the planet. And now, rather than breaking up because the planned event didn't occur, uh, what happened is they became even more fervent in their beliefs. And now they tried to proselytize and get people to join the cult. And they made up pamphlets and literature and things uh, to try and get people to join the cult. And so, uh, this was by and large what Festinger had predicted. He predicted that when they got this uncomfortable information, they, the uh, aliens didn't show up. Well, rather than becoming less fervent in their beliefs, just as the cognitive dissonance theory predicts, they actually became more fervent in their beliefs. So, let's talk about now some of the good things and bad things, maybe, about uh, uh, participant observation. Let's talk about the advantages of participant observation, and this is relative to just doing like a naturalistic observation in which the uh, researcher is not actually a participant. Uh, the advantages of participant observation is that one thing is it allows the researcher to gain intro, introspective data not available to non participants. We're going to get this done. This happens. There we go. Advantage of participant observation first is allows the researcher to gain introspective data not available to non-participants. So uh, Festinger and his students could report on how they felt during uh, their encounter with the cult, uh, which would not be available to somebody who was just observing them from afar. Uh, other instances, we're going to talk later about this guy who did a participant observation with a Satan-worshipping cult, and he participated in all their rituals, and so he got to, like, drink the drinks they were doing during the ritual and participate in all the uh, rituals that they were doing. And so he got a lot of introspective data uh, from that that wouldn't be available to somebody who's not participating. That's one good thing. Uh, another is it allows access to groups that do not want to be observed. Now, you might call this a good thing or you might call it a bad thing. Uh, certainly, uh, Festinger would not have been allowed to join that Satan-worshipping cult uh, unless he, well, Satan-worshipping cult, the, the cult, the, the Mrs. Keech's cult, uh, if he hadn't said that he believed in what they said. And we'll talk about the Satan-worshipping guy later. He would not have been allowed to join that cult if uh, he wasn't an actual member. So that was the only way to actually observe them. Now, some people, a lot of people, <laughs> would say uh, that's kind of unethical to lie to people to gain access to them. We will talk about that later, about the ethics of persistent observations. So that's something to think about now. Now, the disadvan and disadvantages of participant observation are uh, that uh, main is the participation of the researcher may alter the behavior being studied. And that is the big problem with these. Uh, let's take the uh, 
cult around Mrs. Keach. Festinger and his two graduate students joined that cult. It was a very small cult. There were seven members before they joined, so that means they were 30% of the cult, and they participated in all the decisions. Well, Festinger knew how he wanted this to come out. He wanted it to come out so that it supported his theory of cognitive dissonance. Uh, and so uh, we don't know to what extent he and his graduate students may have influenced the decision-making processes of the group such that it came out how he and his graduate students wanted. So that's the real problem here. You are now, as a researcher, participating in the decisions of the group and influencing the behavior of the group, and you may influence it in such a way that the results come out the way you want them to. Okay, so that's participant observation, and there's good and bad things about that. And there's, well, there's good and bad things about naturalistic observation as well. And so that's how I've decided to organize the lecture today. I'll talk about the good things about naturalistic observation and the bad things. So... Let's start with positive. Oh, why, why? All right, disadvantage of participant observation. Participation of the researcher may alter the behavior being studied. I'm sorry about that. I'm getting the hang of this now. Uh, so let's talk about positive aspects of naturalistic observation. Positive aspects of naturalistic observation. Okay, well, I know uh, I had a student who took this class, Psych 301, but they also took the uh, Human Development and Family Studies uh, Research Methods class, and they also had a lecture on naturalistic observation, and they told her that there was no point in doing a naturalistic observation. Uh, and that's, oh, I don't think that's true. Uh, as long as you keep naturalistic observation within its proper sphere, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a naturalistic observation at all. And there are some really good things about naturalistic observation, so that's what I want to talk about first. So let's put this in bold, because that's kind of a header here. Positive aspects of naturalistic observation. All right, number one. Often allows the collection of data impossible to obtain otherwise. Okay, the alien study we mentioned earlier provides a good example of that. There's no way that they could have observed the inner dynamics of that group without actually joining the group and observing them. So to an outside observer, there'd just be absolutely no way to collect the data they collected. Jane Goodall with her uh, work with the chimpanzees. So if you want to know, for example, if chimpanzees eat meat and whether chimpanzees use tools when they're living in the wild, Pretty much the only option that you've got is go down and observe a group of chimpanzees that are living in the wild and see if they eat uh, meat and use tools. So for certain research questions, they're absolutely the only way that you can answer that question. And so they're good for that, uh, if nothing else. So number one often allows the collection of data impossible to obtain other ones. All right, number two, high in external validity. High in external validity. Well, remember what external validity is. External validity is the extent to which your results uh, from the laboratory apply to the real world. Well, in the naturalistic observation, you're, all you're doing is you're actually just describing the real world as it exists. So it's very difficult to argue that it doesn't apply to the real world. So I would say of all the research techniques that a researcher has at their disposal, naturalistic observation is definitely the highest in external validity. It pretty much has to apply to the real world because it's a direct observation of the real world. All right, and because of this, number three uh, is uh, can be used to verify, verify the external external validity of an exper experiment. It okay, can be used to verify the external validity of an experiment. Because it's so high in external validity, that can be used, naturalistic observation, to test a laboratory result. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not. It was a long time ago. But we talked about, I talked about, uh, when, back when we were talking about sensitization effects, 
about these water spilling studies that they did at the University of Kansas where what they made people think was that they'd spilled a glass of water and then the dependent variable was would they go and get a, a roll of paper towels and clean up the water that they'd spilled. And I said the most striking result that they got from those studies is they got this result where women were a lot more likely than men to actually go get the paper towels and clean up the water. Now we might be tempted from that result to think that, okay, well women are generally more interested in, in engaging in helping behavior than men are. But the problem with that is we've got kind of a Hawthorne effect going on here. What I mean by we have a Hawthorne effect is that the people in the study know they're being observed by the researcher. And so they may have changed their behavior just because they know they're being observed. So women might not be more likely to help in general. It's just like that they were more likely to help in this situation because they knew the researcher was watching them. And so they may just have wanted to please the researcher more than the men did, and so that explains the difference in their behavior. Well, we could do a naturalistic observation to see if, is it the case that women in general, when they know they're not being observed, actually show more helping behavior than men do. So what we could do is, a standard task for this is to find a mailbox somewhere, and then take a stamped addressed envelope and uh, put it on the ground maybe 20 feet from the mailbox. So it looks like somebody was going to post the letter in the mailbox, but they dropped it and it didn't make it into the mailbox. And so uh, what the uh, dependent variable is, is when somebody passes by the letter, will they bend down, pick it up, and then put it into the mailbox. So you could set up a situation like that with a letter uh, 20 feet from a mailbox and then sit somewhere surreptitiously so uh, it doesn't look like you're uh, involved in the situation at all. So sit fairly far away from the mailbox. And then notice, uh, keep track of how many men pass by the letter and what percentage of them put the letter in the mailbox and the percentage of women who do so. And if the percentage of women who put the letter in the mailbox is higher than the percentage of men, well, then I think it makes you more confident that the reason that the women in the first experiment helped is because they really are more likely to help. It's not because they wanted to please the researcher. So that would be a way to use a naturalistic observation to verify the external validity of an experiment. And it's useful for that because naturalistic observation is so high in external validity. Okay, number four, number four, relatively uncomplicated, relatively uncomplicated. Now, what I mean by that is, in terms of, like, equipment costs, usually naturalistic observation has the lowest equipment cost. You don't really need laboratory space, you don't need a sign-up sheet, you don't need lab equipment or anything like that, really. All you need is a pad, a paper, and a pencil to do a naturalistic observation. So that's why a lot of uh, smaller Psych 101 classes, they'll often have students do a, psych, uh, a naturalistic observation as part of the class, uh, and just because it's, it's fairly cheap to do. So as research techniques go, it's one of the cheapest ones. All right, number five. This is the fifth good thing about naturalistic observation, is it's an excellent starting point for generating testable hypotheses. Excellent starting point for generating testable hypotheses. And what I mean by this is, if you don't have any ideas about a subject at all, you might start with a naturalistic observation in order to come up with research ideas that you could actually test with, maybe using the correlational approach or using an experiment. So it's a good way to generate research ideas. Well, let me tell you a story about uh, these problems they were having at Michigan State. This was quite a few years ago, but uh, Michigan State University was having problems, kind of like the problems that Iowa State had with Visha, where the undergraduate students were getting drunk, and then they were engaging in vandalism and rioting, and they caused a lot of problems. And so the university developed this task force, and the purpose of the task force 
was to develop uh, uh, possible strategies the university could use to reduce undergraduate drinking. And so as part of uh, their research on this problem, the task force decided to do a naturalistic observation. What they did is some members of the task force went to a bar and they thought that maybe the container in which people bought their beer might actually influence uh, how much they drank. And they wanted to do a naturalistic observation to see if this was true or not. So what they did was uh, they would sit at a table at the bar and then they'd watch for people at the bar whether they bought the first drink of the night, whether they bought a glass of beer, or whether they bought a bottle of beer, or whether they bought a pitcher of beer. And then they would surreptitiously observe them over the night to see how much this person drank over the night to see if the container in which they bought their beer influenced how much they drank. Now, what they found from this is that uh, the people who bought a glass of beer first, they drank the least. And the people who bought a bottle of beer, drank, they drank a little bit more than the people who drank a glass, but it actually was not statistically significantly more. So it was some more, but essentially the glass and the bottle were about, about the same. But then, if they bought their first drink in a pitcher, wow, then they drank way more than if they bought it in a glass or a bottle. They drank almost twice as much if they bought the beer first in a pitcher. Well, the task force concluded on that basis that, well, it's, it's buying beer in pitchers that is causing people to drink so much, and so... Uh, well, the only logical conclusion is you need to outlaw pitchers. All right, and I think you're probably as upset about this as I am. The claim here that they're making is that buying beer in a pitcher caused people to drink more. And uh, I'll have you reflect for a second. Usually I'd ask the class this, but well, what sort of research technique must we have used in order to establish cause? And I, the answer is it must have done an experiment. We have to do an experiment to establish cause. This was just a naturalistic observation. And so they're claiming that uh, buying beer in a pitcher caused people to drink more. But I think probably we can come up with an alternative explanation. I, again, I'd ask you this if we were in class, but uh, is there another reason why somebody uh, who drank a lot would buy their beer in a pitcher other than buying the pitcher is causing them to drink a lot? And I think the likely reason is somebody who goes to the bar planning to drink a lot, they are likely to buy the beer in a pitcher because it's cheaper that way and you don't have to wait for the waitress to come around so much. So sometimes when I go out to the bar, I want to have a nice glass of beer. And sometimes when I go out to the bar, I want to, you know, get blind stinking drunk. And when I want to get blind stinking drunk, I don't mess around with a bottle or the glass. I go for the pitcher, baby. And so it could be uh, it's really just as likely that uh, the desire to drink more was causing the purchase of the pitcher rather than the purchase of the pitcher was causing people to drink more. Now, how could we establish that it really was? It's possible, right? It really is possible that buying the beer in the pitcher caused people to drink more. But we would have to do an experiment to establish that. Now, it would be a fun experiment to do if we could get it past the ethics committee. What we'd have to do is advertise this as a study where you can have all the beer you can drink. And we'd randomly assign some people to get their beer in a glass, and some people to get their beer in a bottle, and some people to get their beer in a pitcher. And if under those circumstances people really do drink more if they get a pitcher than if they get a, a glass or a bottle, well, then, yes, I think we are justified in saying that it was the drinking the beer in the pitcher that caused the people to drink more. But barring that, no, we can't say that based on the research that they did. So, the whole point of this is five excellent starting points for generating testable hypotheses. It was good of them to do that a naturalistic observation in the bar. That gave them a good idea problem was they stopped there. You don't want to stop there. That just gives you an idea of this relationship that might exist. They needed to follow it up with an experiment to see if the relationship actually is a causal relationship. All right, that's number five. All right, number six, the sixth positive aspect about naturalistic observation 
is it studies behaviors as they unfold over time. Studies behaviors as they unfold over time. So usually in a laboratory, we're getting a little snapshot of uh, usually a person's behavior, or an animal's behavior. We're looking at almost always the effects of independent variables who affects are pretty much immediate that we can measure in the laboratory. So that really constrains some of the research questions that we can ask. The wonderful thing about Jane Goodall's studies in Africa is she's seen a lot of the chimpanzees there from the day they were born until the day they died. And she can talk about the events uh, in their life that, that caused them to change their behavior. So if you like animals, Jane Goodall has written a couple of uh, popular press books. Uh, they're not intended for scientists. They're intended for the average person. That describes her work down there with the chimpanzees and describes the chimpanzees' behavior. And they're really good books if you're interested in animals and animal behavior. Uh, but one of the things that she talks about are several of the animals have had you know, horrific events that occurred to them, and she talks about how that affected their lives, like, well, this is pretty awful. There was one uh, female chimpanzee in the troop, and there was another female chimpanzee and their son, her son, that really did not like this female chimpanzee. And every time this female would have a baby, they would, you know, day after it was born, grab it and kill it, and, uh, you know, pretty awful. Uh, and it drove this uh, female chimpanzee crazy, essentially. And so, yeah, chimpanzees can be not very nice animals, and they want to be. But that's the kind of thing you could only get in a naturalistic observation. So it's very rare that psychologists study variables that might influence somebody over their whole lifetime. Okay, well, I see those as the positive aspects of naturalistic observation. And I particularly think uh, it's useful for generating research ideas, for answering simple questions, by which I mean questions that don't involve the relationship between variables like whether chimpanzees in the wild eat meat, whether the chimpanzees in the wild use tools. Those are really examples of questions that can only be answered using naturalistic observation. But like most things, there are some bad things about naturalistic observation as well. So now let's talk about negative aspects of naturalistic observation. Negative aspects of naturalistic observation. Put the bold on it. Okay. Number one, practical problems with data gathering. And by practical problems with data gathering, I mean, it's difficult to observe behavior and record it at the same time. That's one problem. And B, second problem, can be very time consuming. All right, so let's talk about each of these practical problems with data gathering. Well, in the old days, when people would go out with their pad of paper and their pencil and record something, let's say they wanted to record chimpanzee fighting behavior, well, most of the time, not much interesting was going on, as you can imagine. And then when there would be something of interest, when two chimpanzees would start fighting with one another, well, then the person is trying to scribble down very quickly what is going on while the event is going on. And so they're probably missing some of the event, as they're recording it. And so for the old timers, this was a huge problem, and they had to find ways to get around it, like code particular events and have little codes to do that. But it's not so much of a problem anymore because it's so easy to get cheap videotaping equipment. I mean, most people have a phone where they can just record what they see. And so now the thing is, what you do if you wanted to observe chimpanzee fighting the behavior is you just film it, videotape it, and then you can observe it frame by frame later for what you want to record. So that's the nice thing about this, that technology has made naturalistic observations a lot easier to do. But let's talk about B, can be very time consuming. Like we said before, in terms of equipment costs, naturalistic observation is one of the cheapest research techniques 
terms of labor costs, it can be one of the most expensive research techniques. Uh, I remember I had to do this, a naturalistic observation, when I was an undergraduate in Psych 101. And what I decided to do is I decided to do my naturalistic observation at a, a museum that was on campus. My hypothesis was that as people went through the museum during the day, they would actually get more and more bored by the exhibits, and so they would start out feeling fresh and, and not very fatigued, and they'd spend a lot of time at each exhibit. But as they went through the day, I thought they'd become more fatigued, and then they'd spend less and less time on each exhibit. And so I went to this natural history museum that was on the campus of the university where I was. And I divided each floor usually into three sections, and there were three floors. And then when people would come in to uh, see the natural history museum, I would follow them surreptitiously. I'd just be kind of sitting there. And I'd record how much time they spent in each of the sections I'd marked out. Well, it usually took people two or three hours to go through the entire museum. And so what that meant was during, uh, I'd spent a whole Saturday doing data collection, and I'd be very lucky to get even three data points uh, by the end of the, of the day. So that was a dumb thing to do in retrospect. I should have done something that was uh, shorter to observe anyway. But uh, you can see I was spending uh, hours, eight hours, to get three data points, essentially, uh, every time I did this. So very, very time-consuming. Uh, time and so that's one of the worst aspects of naturalistic observation is it's really expensive in terms of labor costs. All right, number two, uh, observing can change the behavior. Observing can change the behavior. Okay. Well, we talked about uh, this, and this is called, what's it called? Uh, a uh, demand characteristic that refers to the fact that subjects can change their behavior because they know they're being observed. Well, that is the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect. And you've got more problems with the Hawthorne effect in naturalistic observation really than any other research technique. People aren't going to act naturally if they know they're being observed. Another guy who did a research study was this guy, uh, Bechtel. Uh, he actually did the same naturalistic observation in a museum like I did. But he wanted to look at the effects of letting people know they were being observed. And so he measured how much time it took people to uh, walk around the museum. But what he'd done is he'd randomly assigned each person who entered the museum to one condition or another. In one condition, he wouldn't tell people that he was observing them as they went around. In the other condition, he would tell people, I'm doing a study today and I'm going to uh, observe you as you walk through the museum, but don't let that influence you, just act naturally. Well, at the end of the study, he asked the people who had been told they were being observed, do you think my observing influenced you? And all of them said no, they didn't think that being observed influenced their behavior. But the thing was, if you looked at the people who knew they were being observed, then relative to the people who didn't think they were being observed, the people who knew they were being observed went around the museum in almost half the time that the people who didn't know they were being observed did. And so it did make them nervous or something, I don't know, but they went around the museum quite a bit more quickly because they knew they were being observed. Well, there are some easy solutions to this. The most obvious solution, solutions, uh, it would be A, uh, don't let, sorry, don't let those being observed realize they are being observed. Don't let those being observed realize they're being observed. That is, if you can sit on a park bench somewhere far from where the actual people are, that is, of course, the best possible situation. Sit surreptitiously at a bar table like the people in the Michigan State study did. Nobody in those studies realized they were being observed. Uh, and so that, that's the best solution, obviously, of all. Now, sometimes that is not possible. 
I read about one study uh, in preparation for this lecture about a guy who wanted to do a naturalistic observation of familial interactions. So he got this family to agree to be the subject of his study, and so he was going to sit in uh, their living room and observe them interacting. And he made some rules. He said, well, you got to stay in the living room or the kitchen or the family room because I can observe those three rooms. And I don't want you to, like, watch TV or listen to the radio or play on the computer because I want to see your interactions. And, oh, by the way, interact naturally during all of this. Well, that's ridiculous, of course. Nobody's going to interact naturally under those circumstances. It sounds, uh, it sounds awful to me being stuck with my family with uh, absolutely nothing to do. And what he tried to do, and I guess the only thing you really can do in that circumstance, is number two, habituate the subjects to the presence of the researcher. Habituate the subjects to the presence of the researcher. So you would spend maybe a week in a circumstance like that acting like you're collecting data, but not actually collecting data. Eventually people will get used to you and start acting normally. That's the idea. However, you can never be sure that actually works. And so, much, much better not to let the people know they're being observed. That's a much better solution to this problem. But sometimes it's just impossible. Okay, that's the second negative aspect, is that observing can change the behavior. Number three. Observer bias can greatly affect... Eh, affect the results. Observer bias can greatly affect the results. Problem here is, you know going in, if you're a researcher, what would be good for your theory when you do this naturalistic observation. So like Festinger, of course, went into that participant observation and he knew exactly what he expected to see if his theory was right. And so the problem is that this may bias uh, the way that you, <coughs> sorry, so may bias what uh, you see and how you record the data. Okay? So let me give you some examples of this. There was a famous example of this Dartmouth-Princeton football game uh, in the 1950s where uh, there had been uh, a bunch of uh, fights on the field. The players have been fighting with one another. Uh, and there had been a lot of like cheap shots, late hits, and hits out of bounds and things like that. Uh, and so what they'd done was they would had a film of this Dartmouth-Princeton football game. And then they'd showed it to some Dartmouth students and they showed it to some Princeton students. And so let me see if I can do this uh, on here. What I'll show you is what they were supposed to do is count the number of fouls, personal fouls that each team made. And a personal foul would be like grabbing somebody's face mask and twisting it or hitting a player after the whistle's blown or hitting a player after they're well out of bounds or uh, hitting somebody after the play. And so what they were supposed to do is watch the movie and they were supposed to count the number of... We'll go number of... Number of, okay, number of Princeton, and then number of Dartmouth, please. All right, we're going to get this. Vowels. And number of Dartmouth fouls. Okay, we're having a lot of trouble. Okay, and this was, now, this was the Dartmouth students. The Dartmouth students, when they were asked to count the number of fouls each team made, they counted 4.4, uh, 4.4. We're going to get this right. We're going to get this right. 4.4 Princeton fouls and 4.3 Dartmouth fouls. But when the Princeton students were asked to do the same 
thing. It's your heart. They counted. 4.2 Princeton fouls. And 9.8 Dartmouth fouls. Even though they were both viewing the same take. And so each school's students wanted to believe the other school was the worst. And so they were obviously changing their criteria what counted as foul as a foul in order to make the results come out that way. There was a similar study by Cass and O'Leary where what they did was they showed a videotape of some kids at a preschool just playing with one another and they were just normal kids and they just videotaped these kids playing. Then they showed this videotape to two groups of people. One group of people was told they were just normal kids and the other group of people was told they were hyper-aggressive kids who were being treated for their aggression. And they were supposed to, the people uh, who are watching the videotape, were supposed to count the number of aggressive acts they saw the kids commit on the tape. Well, as you can imagine, the people who thought they were hyper-aggressive kids or being treated for hyper-aggression saw almost twice as many acts of aggression on the tape as the people who just thought they were normal kids. People were biased to see acts that uh, most people would not call aggressive as being aggressive if they thought the kids were being treated for aggression. So, obviously, uh, if there's observer bias, uh, that can affect the results. Now, there's a clear solution to this. The solution is to use a double blind procedure. Here's a double blind procedure is the best solution to this problem. Bless your heart. Okay. Uh, that is, the people who are doing the observing should not know what the hypotheses are in the study, and the people who are being observed should not know what the hypotheses are in the study. That's the best way to handle this. There was a guy in HDFS who wanted me to be on his master's thesis committee. For your master's thesis committee, you have two people from the department, two professors, from the department in which you're getting your degree, and then you have one outside professor uh, who evaluate your master's thesis research. Uh, and he wanted me to be the outside professor on his master's thesis committee. And what he was planning to do, his hypothesis was he was going to go to a, a dance bar, a bar where they had dancing in campus town. And he was going to observe interactions, do a naturalistic observation. His hypothesis was that guys who asked girls to dance would be rejected more often than girls who asked guys to dance. So he's going to keep a track of the percentage of guys who were rejected when they requested dances and the percentage of girls who were rejected when they requested dances. Well, uh, what I told him was, well, you got a problem here in that you're going to be at this noisy dance bar where even under the best of circumstances, when you're sitting at a table with somebody, you can barely hear what they're saying. And in this circumstance, you're going to be trying to infer what people are saying from far across the room where you couldn't possibly hear what they're actually saying. So what that means is you're just inferring from the body language of the people involved what the interaction was about. And so you also know what you're uh, trying to find. And so if you want me to be on your committee, what you need is two observers, not you, because you know what, the, uh, what you expect to find here. Two observers who are totally blind to what your hypothesis is. And I want them to go to these bars separately, independently of one another, and collect this data so we can see if the data are similar to one another. And he refused to do that, and so I wouldn't be on his committee because that's, that's really not, not good science that he was doing. So, best way to overcome the problem that observer bias can influence the results is you use observers who don't know what the hypothesis is that's being tested. Okay, well that was number three, the third kind of negative aspect of naturalistic observation. All right, number four. Please stop doing that. Uh, in, <laughs> in some situations, likely unethical. Likely unethical. All right, let's return 
to what we talked about earlier. Participant observation in general uh, suffers from this problem. So let's talk about like the cult with Mrs. Keach. Um, Festinger and his graduate students lied to them to gain access to them. Uh, they told them that they believed everything they believed. So a lot of people would say that's unethical. Um, there was this guy who studied a Satan worshiping cult. And he uh, went to the Satan worshiping cult, said he was a Satan worshiper, swore up and down that he wouldn't reveal any of their secret rituals or anything. So they let him join. And then immediately after he joined the cult for six months, he wrote a book about his experiences where he revealed all the stuff he said he wasn't going to reveal. Uh, another case was uh, uh, in uh, Canada. There was a researcher who wanted to do a naturalistic observation of, well, the Mennonites, essentially the Amish. So these are people who don't use electricity and uh, live uh, very kind of... Uh, insular lives. They don't interact with the outside community very much. And so he just wanted to go and do a naturalistic observation of their practices and how they lived. So he wrote to several Mennonite communities in Canada and all of them rejected him. They said, no, we don't want outsiders uh, observing our religious beliefs. And as you can imagine, the Amish aren't uh, too big on scientific uh, research uh, anyway. So, what this guy decided to do was dress up like an Amish person and then go to this um, uh, Mennonite community, Mennonite person, I guess. Dressed up like a Mennonite person, joined this Mennonite community in British Columbia. He said he was from Eastern Canada. He decided to leave the Mennonite community he was a member of there and join their community, and so they accepted him in. And again, he wrote up this naturalistic observation when he was done. Well, uh, this is considered really unethical and is often discussed in questions of the ethics of participant observation. I know we would not get that past the ethics committee here. If you're lying to people to gain access to them, that is really, really bad, and I don't think it can be justified. Now, these people have a right to their privacy, and so I don't think a lot of these studies that may have been acceptable 60 years ago I don't think they're acceptable now. So I would say, in general, if you're lying to people to gain access to them, that's unethical, and typically that's what a part participant observation does. All right, fifth, the negative aspect of naturalistic observation is it cannot be used to determine causality. Okay. Only an experiment can be used to determine causation. So, of course, a naturalistic observation is going to be inherently limited. You don't have any control over any of the external variables in the situation. That doesn't mean there aren't some researchers that try to use naturalistic observation to determine causality. I read this study by Hall and Vecchia. It was a study of touching behavior among heterosexual couples. So that what they looked at was couples in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they looked at how often that the man touched the woman and how often did the woman touch the man. This was done in a public park, I believe. And what they found is for the younger couples, the ones in their teens and 20s in particular, the male touched the female more than the female touched the male. But they found in the older couples, the ones in the 60s and 70s, the female touched the male more than the male touched the, the female. And so their argument was that early in a relationship, the man is very important to the man to establish dominance. And so that's why he touches the female more often early in the relationship. But later in the relationship, that's not so important, so he doesn't do that anymore. Well, maybe. I bet if we were to sit here for a little while, we could come up with explanation at least as good as that one for what they observed. In particular, what they observed doesn't explain why the older uh, women touch the men more than the men touch the older women. So, uh, and a good explanation for that might be that, well, uh, men uh, have shorter life expectancies than women do. They get sick earlier, and so maybe with the older couples wouldn't surprise me if the woman is taking care of the man more than the man's taking care of the woman. But either way, we really can't say based on a naturalistic observation because it's not an experiment. They didn't do random assignment. 
I didn't have the research or manipulate the IV. So, point of all this is naturalistic observation has good things and it has bad things. Uh, you got to know when to use it. It's used, I'd say, to answer simple questions, questions that don't involve the relationship between variables, and to give you ideas that you might use uh, other research techniques to determine. So, that's it for this lecture. We'll have another lecture up for Wednesday, March 25th. We'll talk to you next then.